The UNSC has a plethora of very powerful units at their disposal for application of force in practically any theatre of war necessary. Soldiers outfitted with a powerful arsenal of weapons, advanced personal armour and situational awareness systems, ODSTs with their advanced sealed armour systems and their SOEV drop pods, enabling them to be inserted at speed behind enemy lines to enact pinch manoeuvres and clear LZs, the Spartan super soldiers and their ultra-advanced powered exoskeletons, massive mech platforms like the Mantis and the Cyclops, rapid attack vehicles and reconnaissance vehicles like the various versions of the Warthog, main battle tanks like the Scorpion and the Grizzlies, Cobras, Wolverines, Kodiaks, Gremlins, Rail and Coil Guns, Gorse Cannons, Havoc Nukes, Archer Missiles, Shivas, Nova Bombs, all of this and more are available to the UNSC to aid in military campaigns on terra firma. But so many of these assets would be nearly impossible to actually deliver to the theatre of war without a means of transport to actually get them groundside, to bring their immense power to bear against the enemy and trust me, do not mistake the reality that the power of these different platforms have make even our most powerful and destructive real world weapons look like slingshots loaded with grapes. Indeed, the sheer power of the UNSC would be nothing but a pacified, impotent rage if there was no means to actually deliver this power to the front lines via a highly versatile delivery method. Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00 and today we give the Pelican dropship the most detailed treatment. So in this most detailed treatment we'll break down the Pelican in a slightly different way to our previous ship breakdowns as she is much smaller and thus doesn't necessitate we analyse her in separate hull sections. So the categories on screen now show the process of how we will analyse the Pelican dropship and gain as much detail as possible about how she functions and why she's so successful as the UNSC's primary transport medium and dropship configuration. The amount of lore on the Pelican is substantial, but there are certain aspects of her function which are still subject to conjecture. Since she is an aerial vehicle by and large, many of her principles of her form and function will mirror that of the principles of modern day aircraft and single staged orbit craft. While yes, there currently aren't many actually functional examples of single staged orbit craft, we at least know the prerequisites of such a vessel and as such can apply a good deal of the physics and principles established from this research to some of the more exotic functions of the Pelican. Again, this will be informed by in-game and extended lore, known scientific principles and my own knowledge to try to provide the most detailed breakdown of the Pelican dropship ever. So with all that said and done, let's load up and get ready to move. The Pelican dropship, otherwise known as the D-77 Pelican dropship, is an extraordinarily versatile single staged orbit space to ground vertical takeoff and landing dropship craft used by the United Nations Space Command. Manufactured by Misra Armoury, the ship was first introduced to service in 2392, meaning that by the end of the Human Covenant War the dropship had been used by the UNSC for 160 years. I challenge you to find a single example of military equipment still in use today after being originally introduced in the 1860s. That being said, it is directly referenced that the D-77 has been in service for over 50 years, so it's likely an earlier model was first introduced in 2392, with iterative changes made over that time, leading to the separate and distinct model D-77. The main variants of the Pelican in use during the Human Covenant War was the D-77 Heavy Troop Carrier Infantry, or the D-77HTCI, and the D-77 Troop Carrier, or the D-77TC. Those two differed in only a very few regards and otherwise served nearly identical roles within the UNSC, so unless otherwise stated, any reference made henceforth will be in regards to both of these variants under a singular moniker, the Pelican. The dropship is truly a massive craft, and its primary role of tactical aerospace lifter sees it used majoritively in pickup and transportation of personnel, vehicles and equipment. It is capable of atmospheric flights and limited space flight and can land practically anywhere due to its powerful VTOL engine system 
and high maneuverability. The pelican measures 30.5 meters or 100 feet in length. It has a wingspan of 23.3 meters or 76 feet and a height of 10 meters or 33 feet. Its mass is 138 metric tons. This size puts her at being comparable to that of a C-130 Hercules military transport aircraft, but over four times the empty weight. Her troop bay measures 6.19 meters in length, 4.65 meters in width, and 3.23 meters in height, 20.3 feet, 15.3 feet, and 10.6 feet respectively giving it a volume of 92.97 meters cubed, being almost identical to that of the C-130. This also means that the troop bay of the Pelican could genuinely fit an M1A1 Abrams main battle tank. The weight, therefore, is likely as a consequence of the engines and the armor plating to the Pelican's hull, but just put that into perspective for just a minute. Although it doesn't look like that in-game, the Pelican is the same size as a C-130 Hercules and can fit an Abrams tank in the troop bay. Doesn't look like it, does it? But it can. The fuselage of the Pelican is a semi-monocoque, meaning it has a structural skeleton of supports and braces to keep its shape rigid and strong. This skeleton can also be considered its superstructure. There is a singular cross-braced titanium structure along the spine of the ship from just behind the cockpit module to the very tail of the ship, with intermediately spaced struts and braces forming the rest of the structural elements of the ship. Onto this, two inches of titanium A armor has been affixed to give the Pelican its outer hull and its primary defense. Beneath this are various layers of intermetallic laminates and composites, as well as elastomers, which not only stop shrapnel and spall entering into the inner areas of the ship, but also harden it against EMP, radiation, and seal any minor hull breaches. In a cross-sectional view afforded to us via the wrecked Pelican dropship within the Highland Training Facility on Reach, we can see a rather significant void between the outer hull and the inner crew compartment. One would assume this serves similar function to a normal aircraft, where all of the major cables, fuel lines and conduits and such run, but also as an intermediate pressure area. At high altitude or in vacuum, the pressure outside of the Pelican would be massively different from the pressure contained within the crew compartment. To offset this pressure differential, it is likely that this intermediate area is held at a pressure between these two extremes to ease overall pressure on the fuselage. At the highest of extremes, the internal pressure could be one standard atmosphere, one bar or around 14.7 psi, where externally the pressure could be basically a hard vacuum, zero bar, zero psi. At this extreme, the force pressing outward over the entire internal surface of the crew compartment would be 1,270 kilograms of force pushing outward. With this intermediate area around 0.5 bar or around 7 psi, this force is effectively halved from the cabin to the intermediate area, then that is halved again from here to the vacuum of space. Obviously, it is likely that the Pelican maintains a much lower pressure than this during vacuum operations, but nevertheless, this feature would ensure internal pressures do not overcome the structural integrity of the weakest materials in the vessel, which is ultimately your lowest tolerance point. On top of this, this area possibly also acts as a kind of spaced armor. Having the two inches of titanium A followed by a void, followed by yet another inch of titanium is significantly better at preventing overpenetration of projectiles than a singular 3-inch plate of titanium. This is because the projectile would lose a great deal of its kinetic energy in the initial penetration of the outer plate. The round, now travelling much slower and with much less energy, enters this area and is likely deflected by the inner plate as its energy is now no longer sufficient to breach this inner armour. The cockpit is attached to the superstructure as a separate module 
as evidenced by the relatively clean break demonstrated between the cockpit and the troop bay on the downed dropship at the Highland facility. The cockpit of the D-77 has its pilot and co-pilot sat side by side, while the D-77H has them positioned in tandem to each other with the co-pilot sat behind and above the pilot. The cockpit module is separated from the troop bay by a vacuum rated bulkhead blast door, which itself is the outer component of a set of airlock doors. There is a small area positioned between the troop bay and the actual cockpit where additional storage and terminals can be found and is sealed from the troop bay by one half of the airlock and from the cockpit by the other half of that airlock. There is also a hatch in the upper hull surface of this area which can also be used to move between compatible vessels or into the vacuum to perform spacewalks. The purpose of this area primarily is to be an airlock between the cockpit and either a depressurized troop bay or the hatch to the exterior of the ship. The troop bay is outfitted with seating and overhead storage. There are concealed storage compartments under the seats and under the deck itself and a vacuum rated double hinged troop bay door at the rear of this compartment. Directly behind and above the troop bay is a magnetic and hard point attachment cradle for various additional attachments including warthogs, mongoose, scorpion main battle tanks, weapons capsules and extended troop bay modules. The most recognisable aspect of the pelican are its engine nacelles, of which there are four two larger nacelles containing the main engines and VTOL thrusters positions towards the centerline of the ship, and two tower-mounted nacelles which hold the rear engines and VTOL thrusters. The four nacelles are articulated and can change their vector independently from each other, granting the Pelican impressive manoeuvring capabilities by vectoring of its thrust. We'll look at the engines more in depth shortly. On the outer edges of the two front engine nacelles, are the pelican's wings. The wingspan is much too small to generate sufficient lift to grant the pelican the ability to fly in the conventional sense. Instead, the VTOL thrusters generate downward force when at slower velocities to maintain altitude, and also employ a gravitic assist generator whereby repulsive anti-gravitic fields are generated to help the ship remain in the air. It is suspected that the gravitic system also generates an internal artificial gravity as it has been witnessed troops in the troop bay even when in zero-g still walk and move around within the troop bay as if under one standard g of gravity. On top of this, the pelican can utilize control surfaces across the ship to aid in maneuvering and change the flow of air around the ship. The ship also exhibits characteristics of an aircraft with a lifting body profile. This means that the shape of the body of the aircraft itself actually produces lift in a similar manner to the aerofoil shape of the wings cross section. With the body producing lift, the small wings producing lift, anti-gravitic generators and VTOL thrusters, the enormous weight of the Pelican remains airborne while still being able to carry heavy cargo such as the 66 ton Scorpion main battle tank. The Pelican is crewed by two personnel who occupy the cockpit at the front of the dropship. The pilots sit on the right side with the electronics operator or gunner or co-pilot taking up the station on the left. There is a different orientation as previously stated in the heavy variant but again the systems are still the same. All flight controls are a digital fly-by light with no manual backups. An integral expert system optimizes stability and adjust the thruster profiles based on the aircraft, its environment, the attitude and cargo, removing any immediate need for the pilot to make these adjustments in flight, instead being able to solely focus on the act of actually flying. Unlike on the later D-79 TC Pelican, the cockpit is only accessible from the troop bay. Motion trackers Radar, LiDAR sensors and computerized mapping systems allow the pilot to plan their way to nearby staging areas as well as warn of incoming threats. The troop bay, colloquially dubbed by the marines as the blood tray, usually accommodates up to 10 personnel in jump seats with small overhead compartments for their weapons and equipment. 
Additional infantry can be carried standing up and increased seating for 10 more can be installed in the center aisle. Otherwise this space can be used to carry cargo pallets, casualty litters, and even small utility vehicles such as the mongoose. On top of this, the pelican carries enough rations and resources to enable prolonged operations without need for returning to base. On the odd occasion, this has allowed stranded pilots from downed pelicans to survive for extended periods of time alone. The pelican is also equipped with an onboard weapons locker which can hold enough weapons and ammunition to arm 30 troopers. At least one pelican has been modified to act as a boarding craft for Operation Red Flag which has enough room to ferry 25 Spartan IIs to their target as well as cutting gear needed to cut through the hull of Covenant warships. Pelicans equipped for soft seal boarding actions have an extendable cover that folds down around the entrance to the troop bay. This configuration was refined during the last days of Operation Trebuchet. The Pelican's primary armament are relatively straightforward and quite modest and generally consist of one or more nose-mounted projectile weapons, typically auto cannons or machine guns. These are commonly called chin guns due to their placement on the vessel. These are controlled via an integrated helmet and display sight system, or an IHAD SS, which links to the pilot or co-pilot's heads-up display and allows them to target the gun simply by head movements. As standard, the Pelican is fitted with a M370 autocannon which is sometimes linked with another such weapon. The M370 fires a 70mm high explosive armor piercing or heap round as standard ammunition with depleted uranium slugs also being an option. This replaced the older 40mm chain gun that was common prior to 2525 and some Marine Corps Pelicans are armed with 70mm rotary machine guns instead of a chain gun. In addition to its primary armament, the Pelican has four externally mounted missile hardpoints which typically hold eight Anvil-2 air-to-surface missiles. However, they can carry a variety of weapon systems or specialized equipment pods. A turret can be placed at the back of the cargo bay to provide covering fire for embarking personnel and can range from machine guns to grenade launchers or even a gorse cannon. Generally speaking, these weapons can be folded up against the roof when not in use. Pelicans utilize a complicated propulsion system that combines vectored thrust fusion ram rockets with air-breathing hyperfans, divided between two primary and two secondary articulated engine pods. This, in essence, appears to be a variant of an air-augmented rocket system. Under normal circumstances, Air-breathing turbojet engines suck air into the front of the engine and push it through a series of compressor stages which compresses the air at a ratio of 30 to 1, meaning the air pressure inside the engine is 30 times higher than the air pressure outside of the engine. This now hot compressed air is then mixed with jet fuel and detonated. The sudden explosive thermal expansion is forced into the narrower engine exhaust where it flows with a higher force and thermal energy than when it entered the engine. This high velocity hot exhaust stream passes over a turbine and exhausts from the back of the engine creating forward thrust. The turbine is spun by this and in turn spins the center axle which turns the compressor stages and the intake fan at the front of the engine where more air is pulled in as a consequence becoming a self-sustained system. These are exceptionally efficient engines, however, they can only get a craft into the transonic velocities without the additional help of an afterburner and nowhere near powerful or fast enough to allow a craft to achieve velocity needed to transition to orbit. There is a version of a supersonic engine called a scramjet or supersonic combustion ramjet where the airflow from moving at supersonic speed is so powerful, a compressor isn't needed at all because the air is already somewhere between 50 and 100 to 1 ratio upon entering the engine. The supersonic airflow is simply rammed into the combustion chamber where it detonates at supersonic speed and is ejected from the engine. Because of this technique, the scramjet has no moving parts, but cannot be used from takeoff. 
scramjets can produce exceptionally fast exhaust speeds comparable to that of a rocket engine. However, it requires a supersonic airspeed to function correctly because it doesn't have the ability to draw the air into the engine itself because it has no moving parts. Both of these characteristics are very useful for the Pelican's function, but they both have their drawbacks which limit their function in fundamental ways. Both of these engines are air-breathing engines, while the Pelican needs to be able to travel in space. The scramjet can produce high enough velocity, if it weren't for it needing air, to achieve an orbital transition, but cannot function from stationary up to supersonic speeds, so another engine would be needed to get it there. The turbojet is extremely efficient and can get a craft from stationary to transonic speeds and supersonic speeds with an afterburner, but cannot get a ship to orbit. These limiting factors needed to be cancelled out. The Pelican's engines appear to have either one or several hypervelocity fans in the front of the engine drawing air into the engine at much higher velocities than our current turbofans approaching transonic. Rather than a compressor behind this, a nuclear fusion drive accelerates this airstream to supersonic speeds. These drives are powered by small-scale nuclear fusion power plants and a technique known as vector drive exhaust, where the reaction mass within the fusion reactor is channeled through conduits into the engines at supersonic speeds. It is then mixed with hydrogen and detonates supersonically, where it then exhausts from the engine. This is a hybridized system. The engine can take the Pelican from stationary all the way up to super and even hypersonic speeds to achieve exit velocity and thus orbit. The air breathing part of the engine simply stopping at extreme altitude and allowing the nuclear fusion drive and its hydrogen fuel as a reaction mass to carry it out into space. It is an ingenious system but has its limits. These two main engines are housed along the spine of the ship and each direct all of their thrust to the respective engine nacelles. These two main engines have four nacelles each, two on the bottom and two at the back, the aft engines being similar but lack a nacelle at the bottom. Because both modules are mounted on rotating blocks, they can redirect themselves from directing the thrust downward to any direction required. The D-77, like most other UNSC aerospace vehicles, is fitted with a suite of countermeasures to warn the dropship of incoming attacks, break target locks, and mitigate the effects of electronic warfare. These include wide-spectrum flares, micro-drone decoys, rainbow laser blinders, radar and lidar sensors, directional jammers, and hard-chop guillotines on data processing modules, that could be susceptible to cyber intrusion agents. To prevent them from being easily taken out by electromagnetic pulses, the Pelican's electronic systems are hardened against DMPs. Due to the amount of time that the D-77 has been in service, and just how versatile and powerful a platform it has become, the D-77 has seen a variety of different variants produced in its time. These are a few of the most prominent. The G-77S is a newer gunship variant of the Pelican, building upon the versatile foundation of the venerable D-77 airframe. The G-77S Pelican is an impressive gunship design cooked up by Isabel and the Spirit of Fire's engineers to help turn the tide of the battle against the banished forces on the Ark. The G-77S gunship boasts a powerful range of armaments, including top-mounted anvil missile pods, four payload hardpoints, a forward M370 chain gun turret, and multiple 12.7mm Vulcan cannons. The D-77C is a modified variant for use by civilian law enforcement and paramilitary operations. Very few modifications have been made to the D-77C over the existing D-77H model, beyond the superficial colour scheme and minor chassis alterations. The standard Pelican's missile and guns have been completely removed, replaced for use with optical and sensor surveillance systems for the tracking and seizing of fugitives as well as addressing large-scale emergencies. 
For situations such as natural disasters, terrorist attacks, riots or other strategic integrations which would require a heavily armoured vehicle for airborne transport, nothing comes close in utility to a Pelican. The D-78 is a variant of the D-77 which has been substantially modified to be more in line with the newer D-79 TC Pelican which has largely supplanted the D-77. Current in-service D-77 airframes are retrofitted with the newer D-79 components and reclassified as D-78s. The Pelican is a tried and tested design. It is versatile and highly adaptive and can ferry troops and supplies between ships in orbit and a planet's surface and back again. It can land practically anywhere and deliver an impressive complement of troops and armour to any field of battle while also being able to lay down a modest but powerful amount of fire itself. Its sophisticated engine systems allow the ship to be a single staged orbit craft and a profile which is likely a sight to behold as it delivers reinforcements to battle, its huge mass briefly hanging in the air then angling upward and accelerating into space like a rocket. It is a craft which is so well visualised and thought out that just speaking about it makes it nearly seem possible to make one. Indeed, I would immediately be on board, both literally and figuratively, if someone were to begin building a real one. Even its engine technology alone, while seemingly currently out of our reach with its nuclear fusion power plant, actually seems nearly possible if you supplement the nuclear aspect with a rocket engine. The ship has been in active service for over 60 years and in that time has seen countless troopers into and out of battle, which is probably why marines love pelicans as much as they do. Thanks for watching. Stick your comments down below. I look forward to what you have to say. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons Neek the Silent Cartographer, Brian, Sebastian, Red Sea, Darian, Stalker of the Realms, Falcon X003, Alvin DW, Flaming Halo, and the Revanche, the Holders of the Mantle, my Glorious Reclaimers, my Loyal Metarchs, and all the other patrons that have jumped aboard to support the channel. You guys are awesome, and all this wouldn't be possible without you. If you like Halo lore discussed to insane levels of detail, hit that subscribe button and the little bell icon so you're told the second new video hits the shelves. Be sure to support us on all major social media channels, including Discord, and if you really love the channel, consider heading over to Patreon and supporting the channel over there. It would mean the world to me and would free up more of my time for me to put into this content and other Halo-related goodness. Take it easy, everyone, and find peace in the domain.